let me welcome you. Let me welcome everybody to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted that you can be here today. We have a vital topic with two really, really good guests. I'm looking forward to our conversation. We've been exploring what academic freedom might mean in the future for higher education for a few years now. We've had a lot of debate, a lot of really good references, some good research and some good discussion. And now I wanted to welcome two folks who have authored a really, really useful document. Stephen Bloom is with the American Council on Education. Jeremy Penn is with Penn America. Excuse me, Jeremy Young is with Penn America. And they've authored a resource guide to academic freedom. If you look on the bottom left of the screen, there's a kind of tan colored box. That'll bring it up. It's about 30 page PDF, really concise, well resourced. It'll keep you up to date on everything and give you a lot of good ways to think about this. And I'd like to ask them, what does academic freedom mean in higher education moving forward? How does it change under the impact of new technologies and new politics? So without any further ado, let me welcome them up one by one, and let me bring up Stephen Bloom. Hang on one second. Let's see if all the machines are connected. Hello, Stephen Bloom. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, Brian. Good to see you. Good to see nice you. to see you, too. Where are you today? Is that the home office? Uh, yes, this is our home office. You know, like many of you, we have uh, my wife often works above me and another child, da oldest daughter over there on the second floor. We're not zoned yeah. for a private office, but that's the way it is nowadays, uh, working hybrid in a hybrid way at, uh, at ACE uh, a couple days a week and then the rest of the time here at, at home. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Right. It's, it's very similar to me when I'm at home, although I usually get overrun by some of the animals. And, uh, and, and but now I'm, I'm I'm here in Georgetown's campus, so we'll see if one of the grad students stops by to say hi. Um, <laughs> well, my dogs are in the crates behind me, so hopefully they'll keep quiet. Oh my gosh! Okay, but we'll understand if we say something particularly provocative, they may respond. Yeah, that's yeah. possible. Or, or if you were the mailman. <laughs> I, don't say it! Don't say it! Don't, <laughs> Stephen, um, I'm just curious. We have a custom on, our, on the forum of asking people to introduce themselves, not by talking about their life so far, but looking yeah. ahead to what you're going to be working on. And I'm curious, in, in your position at ACE, what kind of what are the big topics that are ahead of you for the rest of the year, and what are the big projects? Well, thank you, Brian. Uh, so. Uh... Uh, let me give a little before I even get to answer that. I'll tell you a little bit uh, what I do at ACE, what ACE is. You may be familiar, but just so we all know. So uh, Stephen Bloom, Assistant Vice President for Government Relations. <laughs> I'm part of the lobbying team. I am a fed registered federal lobbyist here at, at ACE. Uh, oh. I have been at ACE more than 15 years. Um, ACE uh, is not a hardware store. It's the it's the convening umbrella organization for higher ed, representing everyone from community colleges to the major research universities like Georgetown uh, and uh, public institutions and public and private and everyone in between. Uh, in addition to our institutional members, we we have an, about 150 higher ed related associations that either represent segments of higher ed uh, like the research universities or the community colleges, et cetera, or administrative officials on campus. Mm -hmm. So what do I do? My portfolio includes this work on what we've uh, uh, labeled so-called divisive concepts, and we're going to spend a fair amount of time today talking about that. But uh, in addition, I work on tax issues and have for many years. Mm -hmm. Those are they're sort of uh, for things that are important to individuals and uh, students and families like saving for college, paying for college, repaying the cost of college, uh, things that are important to both uh, individuals and institutions like charitable giving and endowments, uh, and then other provisions that are really only the most hardened tax official on campus would care about. And I don't need to bore, I don't need to bore you with. Uh, in addition, I work on healthcare and healthcare reform issues Oh, wow. uh, some immigration issues, uh, labor and employment issues uh, have worked on uh, other things over the years and uh, at the moment uh, a lot on free, free speech uh, and uh, this stuff on uh, so-called divisive concepts. Part of that is as a result of the fact that I'm a, a lawyer, we did practice for a number of years in Boston as a litigator and so have some, some skills uh, and familiarity with sort of free speech and First Amendment issues from uh, 
time in law school, I suppose. Um, That's the usual what, route. Right. So what, what going forward uh, this year? Uh, I mean, obviously, this issue of divisive concepts, Jeremy and I will be talking, I think, at length and trying to answer your questions as best we can and how we got to this point in our work um, and the coalition that we've assembled, um, which uh, is made up of uh, not typical higher ed associations, but many of the sort of the scholarly associations or their their sort of coalitions of associations. So, uh, you know, the Humanities Alliance, the American Historical Society, and then also, or, or association, excuse me, American Historical Association, uh, and then also non-higher ed folks like the ACLU and the, and the ADL. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then in addition to that work, uh, I have my other part of my portfolio and the biggest issue there are going to be, I suppose, on the tax side, endowments. Uh, and um, that is a huge issue, um, you know, on Capitol Hill, I suspect. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and that will be a huge challenge this year, um, I think. Um, I think there's likely to be a focus on endowments and uh, institutions of, you know, higher ed, the more well-resourced ones, particularly in sure. the house, in the house. Mm. Uh, and then mm. maybe some issues are in the sort of healthcare, trying to work for, I uh, like uh, student mental health. That's an issue I work on and uh, mm. telehealth, which was something that was a big deal during um, mm -hmm. the pandemic. And I'll continue to try and work on that too. Steve, you're a one man army. I mean, you're covering a, a huge amount of, of, of policy issues at the grand scale for higher education. I have to well, say, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm one among a number at, at ACE. So each of us has these kinds of portfolios. And so it makes for an interesting job. I'll say that. Oh, yep. It must. It must. Yeah. Well, speaking of interesting, hang on for a minute and let me bring your co conspirator, uh, your partner in writing, uh, up on stage as well. Uh, and this is going to be Jeremy Young uh, coming to us from Penn America. Hello, Jeremy. Hello, as Stephen says, uh, I'm the, the better dressed of the two. Uh, so, so happy to be here. Yes. Um, I, I, I'm not going to get into that. I mean, uh, you know, not, neither of you have beards, so I'm already dissatisfied. Uh, but, 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 but welcome. Where, where have we found you today, Jeremy? Uh, well, according to the room of this, the name of this call room I'm in, I'm in uh, Tirana, Albania. That's the, the little photo up here. But uh, actually, I'm in our offices in D.C. Uh, at Pet America's uh, office in D.C. We have an office in New York as well, which is the larger of the two. Um, but the, yeah, I'm in, I'm in our, our D.C. office. Well, excellent. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm just a few blocks away from you and I'm uh, physically and I'm glad to see you. But I appreciate the, uh, the image of Albania over your head. That makes me <laughs> Great. Um, Jeremy, well, you, you heard how we uh, introduced ourselves here on the forum, and I'm, I'm curious, what are you going to be working on at PEN America for the next year? What are the big ideas and the big projects for you? Uh, oh, gosh. Well, uh, here at PEN America, which is you, your listeners probably know is a, is a hundred year old uh, free expression uh, organization uh, made up of writers. Uh, we, uh, I am uh, involved in our education, our free expression education unit, which focuses on threats to uh, legislative threats in particular to uh, free expression in higher education and also in K-12 schools. Uh, cool. So, you know, the, the work I do in, in that uh, area is I, I am uh, the, our, the leader, leader of our team organizing against what we call educational gag orders, these legislative, uh, often maybe known to your listeners as uh, anti-critical race theory bills or uh, divisive concepts bills uh, the, you know that we we do a lot of uh, let it, we run legislative tracking and analysis of these bills we put out a commentary every year and a report at the end of the year uh, to see round up how these bills have progressed um, and hopefully haven't progressed uh, we uh, we and we do a lot of coalition building work uh, to try to uh, bring higher ed leaders and stakeholders together to fight this legislation to keep it from from becoming law. Well, that's a, a that's that's a, a very very close focus um, and one that's badly needed. And I'm really really glad to hear it, Jeremy. Thank uh, you. And and by the way, if if you haven't had a chance to read that PDF yet, uh, there's a great appendix which is just a sampler of the. Uh, laws that uh, that the authors are worried about um, and that's a really handy uh, starting point 
Uh, well, here, let me just rearrange the two of you here on the screen a bit so everyone can see you a bit more carefully. Um, uh, friends, what I'd like to do is ask our guests a couple of quick questions to uh, get them to unfold their thinking about this report and their work. And then I'm going to open the floor up to all of you. So as we proceed, please start revving up your engines for your own questions and your own comments. Uh, I'm sure that we have a great deal to talk about. Uh, to begin with, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by a lot of the work that goes into just a few pages uh, early on. Um, it seems that you're drawing heavily on the Association of American University Pres uh, sorry, uh, faculty for the um, uh, professors for the key century-old definition of academic freedom, which is very distinct from the American tradition of the First Amendment. And I'm also fascinated by your reliance on the Chicago Statement, the Chicago Principles. Um, and I, I'm curious if you could just say a few words, both of you, about how those two key documents fed into your thinking and, and, and how they inform your understanding of academic freedom. Hmm. Stephen, you want to start with start on this one? <laughs> sure. Well, I think that when we were putting this uh, document together, this resource guide, we thought that need to be wo a couple of sort of basic concepts needed to be wo woven together. One was the academic freedom and and what we see are uh, threats to institutional autonomy right and academic freedom as many of your uh, guests uh, today you know know if they're on campus uh, is uh, a long-standing principle in American higher education it, it, in a lot of ways it, it marks us as sort of uh, you know it's certainly unique compared to institutions of higher education in some parts of the world, maybe not so much in Western Europe, but um, mm -hmm. uh, but um, it's a bedrock principle, right? It's allowed us to create institutions that are, uh, uh, you know, enormously important, that attract the world's smartest uh, students and faculty that have led to, you know, dynamic society, a democratic society, um, and uh, you know, a vibrant economy in a lot of ways because it allows faculty to engage in research in the way they, they deem most appropriate that generates uh, um, all sorts of uh, important uh, outcomes that uh, can and do benefit the larger society and the common good. And so we thought that it was important to go back and look at these founding documents the, or statements, I suppose, the AAUP, the, the early 20th century kind of uh, formative document, and then their update in 1940 of uh, statements about academic freedom, because they, they really are quite good. Uh, and we thought it was important to include that in there. And then the Chicago Principles is, you know, a pretty prominent example of the way in which a, a very uh, selective institution have uh, a number of years ago made a, a very uh, uh, deliberate uh, and uh, you know important statement about the value of free speech on campus and mm -hmm. that uh, all views should be you know should be heard even controversial views and some that on camp folks on campus may not agree with right that that was that's an essential part of American higher education so that was why we I think we wanted to include that, right, Jeremy? I don't know if you. Yeah, have no, that. I agree. I mean, these these this is a this is a document that is you know is is intended for a wide variety of institutions and a wide variety of stakeholders, and so it was important that we find as many points of consensus or near consensus as we could. Um, you know, these are documents that have been have have achieved, if not consensus. Uh, particularly in the case of the Chicago Principles, certainly wide application and adoption at a variety yeah. of types of institutions in a variety of states um, and 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 state with a variety of political orientations. So, you know, being able to 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 find these touchstones is certainly valuable. And I would also add, we you know we did include one more source, uh, which is the the Pen America has its own uh, principles of campus free speech, uh, yes. which draw on uh, some of the same concepts, but which have uh, additional, you know, we, we like to think of them as being the most specific of the the, the campus uh, speech statements that, that are, are available. They get, they provide specific practical guidance for how to address a variety of, 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 of situations. So we draw on those as well. Oh, excellent, excellent. And uh, thank you for drawing our attention to that, that third document. Um, I, I th This is a topic that is obviously very, very controversial, uh, very fraught uh, and, and very deep. Uh, we've had a we've had two previous sessions on this. Uh, one with um, a couple of authors who had written written a recent book on this, 
um, one from Portland State, one from Penn, and then we had a uh, we had a researcher from Fire, um, the uh, Foundation for Individual uh, Right to Expression, I think, is what they're now called. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, and there was a, there were a lot of different angles, a lot of points, uh, and I, I wanted to raise one right now, which is which has been in the news uh, for various events that have happened. Um, and I'm, I'm not making this point. I, I'm ventriloquizing it because I, I, I've heard this and I might not do it justice. And anybody else who wants to ask this question better than I, please, please feel free. Um, there's the argument that, that some speech is uh, harmful uh, in the sense that it may either do psychological harm uh, to the people who witness it, who hear it or read it or see it. Um, and then it may also uh, tie into structures of uh, inequality or even active violence. Uh, or it may encourage people to uh, act out on uh, horrible ideas. Uh, we saw this, for example, most recently at the, the, the fracas at uh, Stanford um, University's law school, uh, where uh, one uh, very conservative justice was speaking at the invitation of the campus group, uh, and students, along with a, a dean, uh, protested this and saying that the speech um, was harmful to the student body. Um, that was the language of harm. Uh, that was the, the angle here, uh, and that ultimately it might not be worth having. Um, and I, I'm I'm curious. This this seems to be a, I, I think historically a twist on, a, on, a, on an old concept, but it seems to be one that's that's very current. How do you how do how do you you know kind of link these two or integrate these two? The defense of freedom of speech, which le- or academic freedom, which leads to our great research enterprises, um, with the idea of trying to protect uh, vulnerable members of the academic community. That's a really good question, and the, the people who you've had on before, it seems like you've had a lot of my friends on this show recently, uh, Michael Barabay, Jennifer Ruth, some of those folks yeah. over the fire, all, all, all people we and I talk to regularly, and we, we, we have really good and spirited debates over these issues. Um, I mean, I think our pr- perspective at PEN America is that uh, you know, we do have to acknowledge that some speech can cause harm. Um, you know, if, if, a, if, a, if someone you know, walks up to you and shouts a bunch of racial slurs at you, uh, that's harmful. It's not just, you know, you, you can't just say that speech has no impact on people. Of course it does. Um, but it's not the same thing as physical violence. Um, you know, it, it's not the same thing as, as a sort of sort of physical actionable harm. And the problem that we run into when we talk about, uh, you know, how to develop principles around uh, speech is that you know, it's very difficult to, uh, to, to, to uh, who gets to decide? Right. What is the speech that causes harm and what is the speech that doesn't? Um, You know, there are legitimate disagreements over whether certain types of speech are beyond the pale or legitimate views, whether they're hate speech or not hate speech. And if you create a regime where these someone is empowered to to rule some forms of speech out of bounds, you are creating a situation where. Uh, it, it, what you know, who who is able to speak and what is able to be said is really dependent on who is in power, and that is not a good situation for an, a university to be in. It's not a good situation for anyone to be in or any, any society to be in. So, uh, you know, our our, our view is that uh, you know the response to um, the response to the, the speech of some someone you know that is offensive that is wrong uh, is generally to speak in opposition to it. You know, there's no restrictions on that. Uh, you know, we, we don't think that universities, for instance, should be should hesitate to, to speak up against uh, speakers on their own campus who are saying things that are that are manifestly you know, offensive or racist or wrong. Um, but to ban speech, to to declare that certain types of speech other than a clear threat, threat of violence uh, is is out of bounds is really creating a, a situation where you know those same rules that are being used against that harmful speech can be used against uh, speech that that amounts to the dissent of marginalized groups just as easily. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I think ACE we would agree with that. I mean, this notion of <clears throat> the best response to bad speech is more speech, uh, sort of a classic liberal, not not mm-hmm. a, defin- a political definition, but sort of Western uh, uh, liberalism, right? Um, uh, I mean, a good example of this, it's now a few years ago, uh, but when Colombia uh, hosted then president of Iran, Ahmadinejad, who had a long history of engaging in anti-Semitic speech. Uh, uh-huh. And uh, the president of Colombia, uh, President Bollinger, uh, defended uh-huh. the right of the, of the 
uh, the department that invited him to do that because that that's a core academic freedom, right? Uh, uh, and he thought that was essential to an expression of what Colombia was all about. And then when uh, the president of Iran came and gave the speech on stage, I think he introduced him or during that or as part of that was extremely critical of his anti-Semitic statements um, because of the principle of, you know, you respond to bad speech with more speech, not censorship. And I think uh, that that is the position of, of, of ACE uh, on this. And in fact, today, you know, we have uh, a joint ACE um, Pan America op ed that got published in Newsweek that makes that point very strongly and starts out with the, you know, sort of the first paragraph is censorship is something we uh, we associate with authoritarian regimes like China and Russia. It isn't uh, an American tradition and it shouldn't be an American tradition. Thank you. Thank you, both of you. That's a, that's a full-throated um, uh, explication, and, and uh, I really, really appreciate that. Um, friends, uh, I'm going to ask one, one more question, but then uh, I, I would love to uh, uh, stop my speech so I can hear yours instead. Um, and, and this is a, a question about, uh, about technology. Uh, at this point in 2023, we're, uh, we're enjoying or experiencing a great deal of technological innovation. Um, I mean, most recently, people are excited about generative AI, such as ChatGPT and Bing's bot. Uh, but we also have the uh, huge access to recording and sharing information on mobile devices and the sharing platforms of social media and others. And I'm, I'm curious right now, um, thinking about campuses where people can record each other, they can uh, reach out to people live, uh, summon up uh, flash mobs. Uh, get support and host discussions, interpenetrate the physical and virtual realm. Do you think the modern contemporary technology has changed or challenged that understanding of academic freedom in any way? I admit I have never gotten a chat GPT question before. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, while I turn this over, uh, Stephen, you, you want to this one off? Brian, <laughs> you're way more sophisticated technologically than the two of us. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I, I do think that social media makes it more challenging, uh, particularly for uh, academic leaders, uh, you know, our members, the presidents and chancellors of institutions. You know, I, I just think it makes it more challenging, you know, uh, because the speed by which sp speech gets spread uh, and sometimes bad speech that gets spread and their, you know, their 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 tool, their tools for both responding and, and managing that are in, in some cases very limited. If you're a public institution, you can't, right? They yeah. are precluded under the First Amendment from taking steps to, you know, if it's a if it's a Twitter account as an example of a student or somebody else, they can't take steps to restrict that. Um, so I, I just think it does create bigger challenges for for campuses and, and you know, campus leaders uh, for how they navigate and manage, uh, you know, yeah. that's... Yeah. You know the, the use of speech to spread, you know, bad bad speech, you know, so-called bad speech. Um, yeah, I well, think that's true, and I, I think my, my my you know my strongest feeling here is that it's just you know the, one of the one of the things that leads to you know there there is a there is a clear through line between controversies over speech and the increasing difficulty we have in our society and on college campuses with having a uh, civil dialogue and respectful conversation with one another. And social media makes that more difficult. I mean, yeah. one, there, there have been some studies recently uh, in the University of Wisconsin system, in the University of North Carolina system, which have indicated that uh, conservative students do feel censored on campus, but they don't feel censored by their 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 professors. They feel censored by their, their peers outside of class. Ooh. And Ooh. one of the key ways those studies, especially the Wisconsin one, uh, say said that uh, they feel censored uh, by their peers is on social media. They're terrified they're going to say something. Someone's going to record them or write it up and, and post it on social media. This, look at what this person, this awful thing this person said. It's going to go viral and their, their their social reputation will be destroyed. And so it's, it's social media You know, it, is a wonderful uh, opportunity for people to connect with one another when used well. But it's also uh, you know, something that creates, uh, you know, it makes it more difficult to have uh, conversations in what seems to be the relative privacy of the direct interaction. 
Um, mm. It's it, you know mm. the, the the fact that everyone is watching makes it harder to have free and open expression. Well, mm. and to, mm. to pick up on that, I mean, I think that uh, Jeremy's made a good point, which is the polarization of our society and the, the ways in which social media have sort of exacerbated that they've taken root on campus that our students have, uh, you know, in the studies that uh, Jeremy was referenced, we include references to those in the resource guide. And there was an article on, in the Chronicle of Higher Ed yesterday, actually, I haven't, unfortunately, I haven't had time to really read it, uh, but talking about this very issue that it's students that are self-censoring because of fear about what other students, how other students may respond to what they have to say. That is a real uh challenge and it's uh it's a real problem for our for institutions because it runs very counter to what our missions are right mm -hmm. we bring people together whether it's faculty staff and students to to debate uh you know ideas across a spectrum including controversial ideas that's how they learn students that's how they learn to think critically uh to to uh, to confront ideas that are different than maybe their own and so I was heartened to, to learn the uh, last week when I was at a conference on civic learning that there really is a, a growing movement on campus. Uh, uh, and there are some organizations that are very much engaged in trying to help this, this sort of early sprouts uh, to grow into a beautiful garden of teaching students how uh, and others on campus how to talk across difference there are some you know organizations like interfaith america that work sort of in the the difference between students of different faiths and uh campus compact you know is working uh, quite diligently with you know interfaith america and i think uh, maybe pan america uh and and others on teaching students the, giving them the tools to be able to talk across political difference uh, and, and other differences on campus. And that's essential because it goes to the core uh, mission of our institutions. And if students are censoring themselves and feel unable to engage in an honest dialogue, it's a problem. It's a serious problem and it undermines what we're trying to accomplish. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that's, that's a terrific, terrific answer. Um, let me uh, let me get out of the way and just resume my facilitation role because there is more. There are a stack of questions that are just bubbling up, and I want to make sure people get a chance to uh, to put them. Uh, and again, if you're new to the forum, friends, remember in the very bottom of the screen, along that white strip, are a couple of different buttons. The hands up question is, is to join us on stage, and the question mark is to ask a uh, a question. And I'm going to share one of those right now. This is from our good friend John Hollenbeck, and. He asks, doesn't every academic issue have a place where we can say, we can't have that? See the flap at Stanford where students shout down Judge Duncan. Didn't those actions violate his academic freedom? Um, I mean, so, so the, yeah, I mean, yes, but um, the, what's, what's particularly remarkable about the Stanford case is not just what the students did, something that we, we do oppose and we've seen in other places at Yale and other, other, other spots, um, but the, the intervention of the, of the dean. Uh, who stood up and ostensibly to calm the crowd and instead uh, delivered prepared remarks denouncing the judge. I mean, that's, yeah, that's that's completely, we do say that universities should feel free to criticize speakers on their campus, but not during the speaker's own prepared remarks, filibustering those remarks. That's, that's, that's completely off, uh, out of, you know, out of bounds. Um, so yes, yeah, so, and there, there are, uh, there are plenty of uh, infringements on uh, academic freedom that we see on campuses around the country and we um you know i, I should probably clarify pan america's uh you know origin story on, on our our education work you know we, we we initially developed a higher education initiative because we wanted to confront censorious behavior in higher education emanating from the left things exactly like what you saw in stanford and we do that that is a, a huge part of our work um what we are seeing uh, and what, what concerns us and what we wrote about in this report is uh, a response to that, to things like what happened at, the, at Stanford, that is not simply to denounce it, to, to call for action from the university, but to, uh, and I should mention the university did act, you know, they have apologized, they, the, the dean has been placed on leave. Uh, her boss, also a dean, put out a fantastic 10-page letter defending academic freedom in great detail just yesterday. Um, but these responses instead call for government intervention to shut down 
parts of universities that they view as censorious. And there is no universe in which government regulation of speech is preferable to the regulation of, to, to a sort of censorious culture that appears on campus. You're substitute, substitute not only are you substituting a, a one orthodoxy for another, you are substituting a cultural orthodoxy for government orthodoxy, for you know exactly what the founding fathers were thinking about when they wrote the First Amendment, the, the heavy hand of government power telling you what you can and cannot say. Mm. So that's, uh, so that's what I would say. It is, the, the, we are. We should all be concerned about what happened at Stanford. We should right. all be concerned about the culture around the country at campuses that leads to things like this. But we should also be looking for effective solutions that don't make the problem exponentially worse. Right, and I would say, I mean, it, it, it was great that uh, after the fact that uh, the president of Stanford and the dean uh, took such a strong position in, in, in support of free speech on campus. And it's a terrible, unfortunate incident that happened there. I, particularly as a as a you know graduate of the law school, am astonished that the law students who are being trained with the skills to debate different sides of an issue, including sometimes very, you know, troubling speech. I mean, one of the kind of famous cases around free speech when I was in law school was the Skokie uh, case involving the Nazis, you know, getting the right to, to speak in Sk in Sk or, or not speak, but engage in a parade in Skokie, Illinois, which at that time was a community outside of uh, Chicago with a large Jewish population, including a number of uh, survivors of the Holocaust. And, uh, you know, my view, that was the right result that the, that the Supreme Court said that they, they had the right to gauge in parade, which is a form of, you know, pure speech. And so for law students to not recognize that they're being taught the skills to 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 manage and to not manage, but to navigate challenging issues and debate uh, and to, you know, kind of uh, confront, uh, uh, you know, situations where a client they may have, they may not like that that is doing things they didn't, they don't support, but they have the right to be represented well by a lawyer, you know, that they were, uh, you know, engaging in a form of censorship is kind of really troubling. And I think in some ways, when we put the, the, uh, resource guide together that we were talking about earlier, you know, why we wove those two things together, which is, uh, uh, you know, pushing back against the efforts to intrude on institutional autonomy and, and, uh, and academic freedom by uh, state policymakers, primarily at the, at the moment, uh, as well as a full throated, you know, defense or telling, you know, reminding institutions about the need for them to engage in a full throated sort of defense of academic freedom and free speech on campus by citing the, you know, the longstanding principles that Brian, you referenced earlier by AAUP and others. Um, that I think is in some ways why we put all of that together in the resource guide. Well, thank you. Thank you uh, both uh, for a very, very rich uh, answer to John's great question. Um, we have more questions piling up, um, which uh, I think is a good example of more speech following. Um, and uh, we have one uh, from uh, a professor at the New College of Florida. My gosh, Miriam Wallace, what a, you are in the spotlight right now. Uh, and she asks an important question that circles back to a point that came up earlier. We'll put this on the screen uh, about the solution to more speech. What do we do with unequal access to speech? There are mobilizations of social media and politically affiliated media that amplify some speech or false equivalences. This is a great question for my dear friend Miriam. Uh, thanks for thanks for being here. Um, you know, I, I think that we we do need to consider unequal access to speech when we look at uh, what we mean by by free free expression on campus. You know, it is it, one and one. This is one area, frankly, where I think you know there is room for for real for real creative thought within the free expression community particularly as it relates to higher education but also in other ways you know free expression is not just about uh what the people within academia are able to say and and and, and do it is also a question about who is in the room it's a question about who uh, is accepted to college who is able to complete college, who is able to complete a graduate program, who is on faculty, you know, who is on staff. The, these, 
the 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 inequalities of our society as they manifest within the structures of higher education do have an impact on speech you can't have you know free expression is there are two sides of the coin one side is robust protections for people who have it and the other side is extending access to as many people as possible um and and that's that's absolutely central to to this question i think um you know when we when we look at these laws and the laws that we, we address in the in the resource guide uh, you know i i think that um you don't have to believe what I just said is true in order to mount a, a defense of higher education against these laws. You can think everything is fine in higher education and still oppose, uh, you know, attempts to, to uh, you know, for legislators to get involved and restrict it. Um, and again, we're trying, we're, we're work, looking at messaging here that has the widest possible uh, application for the largest uh, group of people who want to defend higher education. But, you know, certainly, you know, if you're asking my opinion, if you're asking PEN America's opinion, um, yeah, it's it's a question of, you know, access to speech is, a, is one of two halves of free expression, the other being protection uh, for those who had who do have access. Mm, mm, okay. Okay. Well, I'm glad that I'm glad uh, that you two know each other, uh, Miriam and uh, Jeremy. And Miriam, uh, my heart goes out to you. Um, what you're going through is uh, hugely important, and uh, I think the word stressful doesn't doesn't say enough. Uh, good luck. And if you want to uh, ask more questions or join us on stage, Miriam, please please feel free. Um, we have more questions piling up, and I want to make sure people get a chance to ask them. Uh, this is from uh, Professor Deborah, at, uh, a uh, professor of English emeritus or emerita at uh, Tabor College. Uh, and we put this up on the screen. Uh, she asks, what can your guests say about the influence that donors seem to have on academic freedom at both private and public institutions? Mm -hmm. How might we as professors deal with this concern? I don't think we've mentioned donors so far. Stephen, you may know more about this one. Than yeah, I I'm not sure. I mean, are you worried that donors are essentially uh, telling an institution uh, that they should or shouldn't have certain kind of speech on campus? Is that the that the nature of? I, I mean, I will tell you that you know to pick up the the story I was telling earlier about the Columbia uh, with the uh, I I know that they 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 heard from a lot of donors that that would be a terrible thing for the for the institution to host Ahmadinejad. And I suspect that they also heard from donors that they would withdraw their donations, but they went ahead mm -hmm. because they believed it was the right thing to do. Uh, and I think that that's what institutions ought to be doing, which is to commit to the principles that have served us so well and uh, to mm -hmm. try and to, to explain to donors that the, you know, what academic freedom means. I mean, part, part of the challenge here is that we don't do a very good job explaining it, right? Some of us uh, mm -hmm. who work on campus and it sounds like, I mean, I'm just a lawyer working as a government relations official for an association, higher ed association, but you know, I'm, I'm sure that your, your, some of your uh, participants are, uh, you know, today, uh, there are lots of faculty members there. They understand it in a much more intimate way than, than I do. But I don't think we we do we do a, a, a service to higher ed, the concept of academic freedom. Uh, we don't do a very good job explaining to the broader public what it means and why it's important yeah. to the broader public, including donors, right? Uh, and it isn't just the, the right of faculty to explore uh, what they think uh, you know, kind of kind of research they think and to test it against their peers uh, and to teach it in a classroom so that students can test it as well. That isn't just it. It's also, um, you know, uh, it has great benefits for the broader society and the common good. We as a society have benefited enormously for the fact that this is a core bedrock principle in higher education. And I think that's what, what institutions ought to be explained to donors. You know, if they're trying to restrict the kind of speech that would take place uh, on campus. Stephen, you and Jeremy asked about uh, examples of this or clarifications of Deborah's question. And in the chat, uh, Hal Hepner just said this, quote, Baylor, Baylor University, Texas, can't show support for LGBTQ communities because of donors, unquote. Um, so I think so, uh, that, I mean, I, mean I, I think like there's, it was you breaking know, in, up in a little bit. Sorry, so the example was Baylor and uh, LGBTQ communities, and uh, I mean, I I think certainly with Baylor, you know, there may be an issue with the with the university's mission statement as well. Um, but um, you know, I, we've certainly seen this case this, this in you know at Harvard, uh, where you know a 
Ken Roth was uh, briefly disinvited as a speaker um, uh, or as a faculty member because of uh, allegedly because of the involvement of a donor. The truth is, this does happen. It is a problem. Um, you know, donors do sometimes have too much influence. Um, but you know, the it it doesn't seem to be as common of a problem as what we are seeing in this legislation, uh, where. You know, the, the, a, a single legislative body, a single law can shut down speech across institutions, across campuses. Donors will sometimes go after uh, a particular issue or a particular individual. You know, certainly at a, at a private institution, it may, their influence might be more pronounced. Um, and, and, and you know, we don't uh, I don't you know, certainly Pan America doesn't think that donors should be should be silencing speech on campuses. Uh, you know, we spoke out in defense of Ken Roth. Uh, you know, we tend to speak out on these cases. Thank you. Uh, those, those are great answers. And, uh, and Deborah, uh, thank you for a really, really good question. Uh, we have two questions coming up that are almost identical, and I want to flash them both on the screen. You, you, you'll see what I mean. Um, one comes from our, our dear friend, uh, author and, uh, and guest, uh, Tom Hames. Uh, and Tom says or asks, what about the impact of silent self-censorship on campuses? Are we seeing more faculty not talking about or researching certain subjects because of either institutional or political pressures? So hold that thought for a second, because then we have a question which just popped in from uh, Heidi, uh, who asks, what quieter insidious effects are you seeing from the efforts of legislators? I'm in Ohio. I'm thinking about faculty who preemptively cut controversial materials. So I, I, they're, they're both had the idea of self-censorship and, and they're speaking of faculty, but I, I would include uh, your earlier point about students who uh, feel they have to self-censor as well. Yeah, good question. So self-censorship does happen, and it, it happens. You know, it it is it is caused by all of these phenomena. You know, we we see conservative faculty, conservative students censoring themselves uh, because of uh, you know in-group pressures essentially uh, from from uh, students or faculty on the left. Um, we see you know left-wing faculty or you know, all faculty in some cases censoring themselves because of fear of what a law will do. One of the arguments we make about these laws uh, is that the the chilling effect really is the point. The laws are, are written in very vague ways so that they it's not clear what they ban and that uh, that amps up the self-censorship because faculty, you know, are not only are faculty unsure what they can talk about, but uh, so are administrators unsure what their faculty can talk about. And you will see administrators in some cases issuing overly cautious guidances where they magnify the effect of the censorship by arguing that, you know, by telling faculty they can't even touch a particular topic. We saw one guidance that, that, for, uh, from a college in Florida that said uh, that uh, you know, if, if faculty want to discuss, have a stu class discussion of the civil rights movement, they have to start the class discussion with a, a verbal disclaimer that what the students are about to say does not reflect the the views of the university. Which um, you know, that just one just made me laugh because I'm thinking if Ron DeSantis is sitting there in that classroom, he's not going to think that what the students are saying reflects the views of the university. Uh, and you know, so yes, there is a lot of there is a lot of fear. There is a lot of self censorship. And ultimately, you know, we we want to encourage people to not engage in that type in, in self censorship. You know, I, I tell people, don't do do what you teach what you're prepared to teach. Teach what you're trained to teach, unless some someone or something has specifically told you not to. And many in many cases, that won't that won't be the case. You know, don't don't look at the law. Look at the climate. Assume. That there may be some sort of uh, censorship coming, you know, wait for it to actually come. Uh, and um, with the Idaho case, yes, I mean, w when you have a climate like what is going on in Idaho, where uh, you know legislators are, have been frankly intimidating uh, institutions, we see this in Florida as well. You know, it's it, it creates a, a a situation where people are simply afraid, even if there is no specific policy or law that is attacking their their institution or their teaching, um, they just don't know where the next attack is going to come from. This is one of the reasons that legislative attacks on academic freedom are so pernicious. Well, and uh, I would add, yeah, I mean, it has a really corrosive effect on the, the life of the campus, I mean, not just individual faculty that are, you know, intimidated uh, and, and self-censor uh, and others who might do that on a campus. It just undermines the whole academic enterprise. And, um, you know, it's part of the reason that we uh, set out on this work uh, that resulted in the resource guide. I think we, we wanted to, you know, to tell, uh, to try and send a signal to people that we need to stand up 
for these principles. And I recognize that there will be some on campus who are more vulnerable to political pressure than others, and that those who have the ability to, to stand uh, against political pressure ought to do it, ought to use it in ways to defend these principles. This isn't, I mean, we're not, I, I, ACE isn't, you know, focused on a particular state, a particular piece of legislation. We're troubled by mm -hmm. the trend, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and because it undermines the the, the academic enterprise uh, uh, and attacks these basic uh, bedrock principles of higher education. Uh, and so um, I think that, you know, we kind of need to stick together on this uh, and to, you know, to, to, to push back uh, and to talk about why, uh, you know, intrusions on academic and free or, you know, undermining academic freedom and intrusions on our autonomy is a bad thing for our society and try and explain it that way. Uh, and, you know, one of the things we, we learned and we talk about it in our, in the resource guide, we did some public opinion research about the, the public's views of, you know, so-called divisive concepts and the, their willingness or their, you know, their, their support or not of uh, elected officials telling campuses what they can and cannot teach. And I will tell you the results are overwhelmingly on across the political spectrum opposed to public officials telling institutions mm. what should be taught and how it should be taught. I think mm. it's because Americans recognize that a core value of our society is free speech across the political perspective, you know, uh, across, across the political sort of, you know, uh, perspective. And they see that as troubling and that, you know, uh, one side may say you can't say this today or teach this today and the other side, the, you know, the, the opposite tomorrow. And, and the result from, from both is bad. Right. And so uh, and mm. un-American in a way. So uh, I think that's, uh, you know, kind of uh, why we were motivated uh, to do the, the work that we're doing. And I think that the public has a lot of skepticism about elected officials telling campuses uh, what and what should be taught and how it should be taught. Well, that's good to know um, in a lowercase d democratic way. Yeah. Uh, friends, we're coming up on the end of the hour and we have a couple of questions I want to make sure we get into. Uh, Stephen, Jeremy, thank you. This is these are terrific, terrific responses. Uh, we have a, a question, um, two questions that come up from different angles that we haven't yet addressed. Uh, and this is one from Shelby Rosengarten in Florida, who has, do you have some thoughts about professors at public colleges and universities being seen as extensions of the state and how that might imply parameters on what we can or cannot say? This is something that we see a lot more often in the K-12 space, um, you know, where there are uh, court decisions that suggest that, you know, teachers may not have, you know, may, may be, you know, essentially, you know, working for uh, empl employees first and teachers, you know, second. Um, there is some jurisprudence around uh, around academic freedom that that is supposed to, uh, you know, go is supposed to set this issue aside, largely aside when it comes to higher education. Um, we certainly there are appropriate restrictions on uh, on teachers in higher education speaking for their institutions without permission. We see this a lot. This is not widely well understood by faculty, and there are violations of this, and and they they are dealt with at, at institutions. But you know, the the AAUP's definitions are pretty strong on on uh, you know extramural speech. Um, that it is permitted, um, that it is, you know, you, you are able to express your views on issues of, of, you know, as a private citizen on issues of public concern. And, uh, you know, the, there, the other area where we often see restrictions uh, of this type, it has to do with, with pedagogy. I mean, there, there is, it, it is more, you know, if you're, if you're doing things that are undermining your students, uh, you know, in the classroom, there is more, um, you know, that can be done or said about that. But uh, generally speaking, we try to, you know, we, we, we don't, we don't try to, to see uh, faculty as extensions of the state in this way. Well, that's a, that's a great question. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Again, uh, Shelby is at uh, St. Petersburg College. So I'm, I'm very glad to see uh, Florida's academics uh, represented here today. Uh, we have uh, another question that comes in from literally down the street from me, about two blocks away uh, from Georgetown University's excellent library. Um, and this is from Ryan Johnston who asks, are these pressures reaching into the scholarly publishing arena? I would refer to new laws in Oklahoma which potentially make librarians liable for the acquisition of controversial content. 
Uh, it's a great question. We've mostly been talking about teaching and about extramural speech, but scholarly publication is a well-defined area. What, what do, you th do you think about that? It's an excellent question. So um, the way this is happening is the K-12 version of these laws, which we haven't spoken much about on this uh, in this 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 uh, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. webinar, um, the K-12 version has been uh, reaching very clearly into school libraries uh, and increasingly into public libraries. Um, what is primarily being targeted so far are um, our books uh, offered to K-12 students, often young adult novels, often picture books, uh, some adult books such as you know, works by Kimberly Crenshaw and other critical race theory scholars that, are, that can be found in school libraries have been targeted. Um, we haven't seen as much of this at the higher ed level. We haven't seen as much of it yet in, the, in, in scholarly publishing. I'm afraid it's only a matter of time. I mean, there's no way that, you're, that people are going to people who want to ban books and censor teachers are going to stop at the at the university doors on this. Um, so I think it is coming, but but at this point, it's it's entirely theoretical. So I can't really say uh, you know, nothing's happened yet. Um, but certainly, I would be concerned if I were in that field. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, Stephen, do you want to add to that at all? Not not much. I mean, I think Jeremy said it said it quite well. I do know that the librarians that, you know, in higher ed are worried about this uh, as, as you know, it's not surprising. Uh, um, and, you know, we have to be vigilant uh, to try and guard against uh, scholars uh, censoring themselves or, or institutions, uh, libraries within institutions being restricted in the kind of, you know, uh, scholarship that they can make available uh, on campus. Uh, that is just, you know, really corrosive. So, uh, we, you know, we think that would be a terrible idea not to be opposed. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I, I would like to take the moderator's privilege and ask the last question before we completely run out of time, um, which is we, we've been talking about the present very closely and, and the two of you have anchored your work very, very nicely in uh, recent history and of course, as far back as the AUP statement. And I'm wondering if we turn your gaze around a little bit to the future. What do you expect for the next few years? Uh, Jeremy, you just passionately spoke of the grim likelihood of more pressures on scholarly publication, on scholars and librarians. Uh, what else should we be anticipating in the whole area of academic freedom? We have seen a set of bills proposed this this legislative session that go far beyond even, frankly, what we're talking about within within the the report itself, uh, within the resource guide. You know, these are bills that one in Florida, one in Texas. Uh, you know, we've seen one in Ohio. There may be more, uh, with varying likelihoods of passing. But these are bills that uh, that target not just classroom instruction but entire university governance uh, mm -hmm. systems that that uh, would hand control of uh, core curricula. Uh, approval and denial of majors, uh, hiring and firing of faculty over to politicians, political appointees, rewriting of university mission statements, and that sort of thing. Um, and so the, the fight for the autonomy and independence of higher education really is just beginning. You know, we are, we are, we are moving into an era that is very troubling in this area that really is in some ways without precedent. Um, and I don't know, I look at these bills, I don't see a precedent for this anywhere in our history. Um, and, you know, that, that is, this kind of vigilance, this kind of coalition building, awareness of the arguments that are effective uh, on this uh, is going to be very crucial. The yeah. fight for the just beginning. Wow. Yeah, it, I, I think Jeremy, it's a, it's a, uh, you know, it's bracing, right? Uh, um, uh, and I think very troubling. And I do think it, not just do we see this virus spreading uh, across states, I think we're likely to see more of this in Washington. I know that the House Education and Workforce Committee is holding a hearing next week on, you know, defending free speech on campus. I'll be curious to see what that hearing looks like, but I, I imagine we'll start to see more efforts here in Washington to, you know, unfortunately, to impose these kinds of uh, restrictions uh, on our campuses. Uh, that's a that's a very very grim note uh, to to uh, bring us to a close on. Um, I I would like to uh, say thank you both for that warning, but also thank you both for your passion, your knowledge, and your incredibly clear and elegant expression. Um, I'm I'm grateful for your work, and I hope that academics can benefit from it uh, a great deal. Um, we are out of time, and uh, I'd like to end by asking you two quickly: What's the best way to keep up with your work on all of this? Uh, starting with uh, Stephen, I mean, you're covering a huge range of. Um, what's the best way to keep up with what you're doing? 
<laughs> well, if you're, you know, if you're a campus, uh, you're on campus, you know, you can see what, and you can go on our on ACE's website to see, uh, you know, kind of the the work that we engage in on a range of policy issues, including this one. Uh, and I would just, you know, on this particular issue that we've devoted so much time, I just, you know, you probably would, uh, you might. Uh, sign up for our for ACE's uh, Twitter account and certainly Pan America's Twitter account. I'm sure we'll be, you know, publicizing our work uh, and the efforts, uh, you know, on this uh, in the future. Very yes, good. we also we also each have uh, email newsletters uh, that you're welcome yeah. to sign up for to get to Pen Americas. Oh, uh, go to our website, uh, pen.org, uh, and there, there's a list of email newsletters. The one you want is called Education Educational Censorship News. Uh, we'll, that'll send you a monthly report on the work that we're doing on this issue. I also put my email in the chat, jayoung at pen.org. You're welcome to email me directly if you have any questions. I'm happy to talk to you further. Yeah, and, and our emails are in the that uh, report you can see in it, you know, Jeremy just gave you, I'm happy to engage with anybody if they want to reach out to me too at ACE. Well, excellent. You both have been incredibly thoughtful, incredibly engaged and very generous with your time and thinking. Thank you both so much and keep up the great work. Thank you. Uh, Bye -bye. And, but, but don't go yet friends. Uh, I've got to point out where we're headed for the next uh, few weeks of the forum. Uh, and let me uh, just thank you all for the great questions and discussion we've had so far. Um, just looking ahead, just to remind you, we have uh, uh, sessions coming on educational technology and labor, a session coming up on reimagining college metrics, along with a session on some hairy guy who's got a brand new book coming out. Uh, so just go to forum.futureofeducation.us to learn more. Uh, if you want to keep talking about this, we have all kinds of places to do that, including uh, Mastodon, including LinkedIn, including Twitter. Just use the hashtag FTTE or tweet at me, Brian Alexander, or even Shindig Events, and we'd be glad to hear from you. Uh, if you want to go into our previous sessions, including our two previous sessions on, uh, on academic freedom, just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive, and you can find those there. And above all, thank you all for a, a great, great discussion, a brave discussion on a very, very tricky topic. I hope you're all doing well. I hope those of you in the Northern Hemisphere are starting to enjoy uh, spring, depending on where you are. And above all, I hope you're all safe. Thanks for everything. Take care, friends. Bye-bye.